OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Thanks for coming. Hi, I'm Avi. Um, this is my co my co presenter, Cindy. <laughs> she's very she's very small. Uh, Cindy sadly got sick and couldn't and couldn't join, but uh, she's, I think she's joining online. So thank you, Cindy, if you're there, you're here in spirit. Um, today, I just want to talk about just a few very simple subjects like removing barriers to education through distance learning, OER texts. I should have put high flex in the title. It's in the presentation, but it's not in the title. Hyplex ahead. Yeah, okay. What happened in 2019? Ah, we were so innocent. <laughs> <laughs> Distance learning back then, do you remember people telling you that they were taking online classes? What was your, what was your reaction back then? Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Must have been expensive. Um, we used to, exactly. Yeah, don't you, don't you want a real class? That's what virtual means is almost real, right? Not real. In other words, not real. It's not a class. Right. It's almost a class. Yeah. Um, and then what about people who got degrees online? Oh, you got your PhD from Phoenix or whatever it might be. You know? Okay, you're not going to be my boss. Sorry. Right. That's that was the attitude. I don't think it's like that anymore. Um, Anyway, so back then, uh, there was very little adoption by adult schools, as you all know, and um, there were some by universities. Community colleges have led the way since the beginning. Let's just let's just be real; they still do. Um, uh, all of the yeah, all of the, the colleagues that I'm most jealous of teach for community colleges. I do as well, but not to the extent that they do. Um, anyways, yeah, it's it's very nice. So. Anyways, when a uh, when a pangolin and a bat love each other very much, um, we get uh, <laughs> mixed results. Um, but we learned from 2019, great time to buy stock in Zoom. <laughs> so we know what happened then. Uh, emergency online learning, which all of our administrators were very happy about universally, beginning to end, right? And so were the teachers. Um, not just those closer to retirement, but those closer to grad school, right? Um, nobody, I didn't want, I certainly did not want to do it. I thought it was going to be terrible. I was teaching French at, at Davis at the time. And I said, language teaching online? Are you serious? Nobody's going to participate. Nobody's going to learn anything. Everybody's going to cheat. This is going to be terrible. None of that stuff happened. And none of it happens now. So um, during the emergency, uh, Distance learning became the domain of 93% of students. That is from the U.S. Census. I didn't just make that one up. Um, <laughs> so at that time, I was teaching at two adult schools and a university. Uh, one of the adult schools was very rural, uh, very, very few, few staff, a uh, few students. We only had two ESL teachers. We were both very much part-time. And then I was teaching at also at Folsom Cordova Adult School, which is a medium size. My boss likes when I say that. Uh, <laughs> it is, though. It's, it's, it's a medium size. Um, and so in my, my foreign language department, we had immediate full adoption. Uh, in fact, all across the university, there was immediate full adoption. Adult schools too. We weren't going to lose, you know, the, the, the steps that, the steps that we had taken that year, we weren't going to let go, any of us, right? So within about a week, we turned it around, didn't we? You remember what happened. We turned it around. We didn't want to do it. It was expensive. It was difficult. People were afraid of getting sick and we did it. So. Uh, and again, the community colleges were they were pretty much already ready to do it. So we learned a few things from them. Uh, during emergency online learning at Folsom Cordova Adult School, our class exams were all administered online. Um, we don't do that anymore because it's very it's very staff intensive, and we don't have tons of staff that can do that. Um, you know, all of us were probably exposed to a variety of solutions for this. Uh, for us, we had Cindy actually. Just one reason why. I would have loved her presence. She did all of the um, online classes testing. We didn't have, she let me know, we didn't have that too many people do so. We had more of the sort of drive-by process kind of thing. She might have experienced as well. Um, and some other strategies like that. Um, at the community college where I teach, we still do that. For all of my, my online courses, process is uniquely administered online. It's, they, don't ever, they don't ever come to campus. 
Okay, what's our takeaway from 2020, aside from all the other things? Um, one size fits some. Hashtag OSFS, that's gonna come up. Not all students enjoy online learning, and we know not all teachers enjoy online teaching. What's more, not all teachers should be teaching online, <laughs> right? You have to be a very dynamic presenter. Um, yeah, there's a really funny, I didn't include this meme, but there's a great, there's a great one about engaging students online and just, you know, involves feather boas and lots of stuff like that. Just trying to really trying to get, get everyone's attention. And the students are sitting there like Bernie, right, at the, at the inauguration. Um, so we had the same, the same schism among the instructors. Engaging students online is not always easy. Um, if you're not comfortable with black squares, you can't do this job, right? Because there are a lot of folks who, for different reasons, can't or won't activate a camera. So um, that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Uh, but for folks who do this a lot, it doesn't. It doesn't make us uncomfortable. And I don't think, in my experience, I don't think it's losing anything because they're not turning their camera on. Some of my most participating students, <clears throat> so my most participating students are ladies who, for cultural reasons, won't, won't turn on their cameras. And they're just talking and talking and talking. They're some of my best. Okay, so the black squares don't, don't scare. All right. Let me get rid of this overlay here. Okay. I've been zooming for a while. Okay. Uh, a couple of just three little best practices things. Um, things I'm, I'm going to rag on just a little bit. How many people have seen these in a Zoom meeting? Big black rectangles, big black squares. What the heck is going on? The presenter usually doesn't know. Nobody tells them, right? One thing that I often do is I try to simulate the experience that my students are having. So I join on my phone and I join on my computer, see what it looks like to them. If my grandma can't read that, then it's not working. She is dead, but if she were alive, right? Same metric, same metric. Yeah, 2011, I'm, I'm slowly getting over it. Um, so we need to really think about uh, human computer interaction and how it differs even from like street to street, neighborhood to neighborhood, never mind around the world. Um, we don't, my agency doesn't at this time have the bandwidth to loan Chromebooks to everybody. Um, we, we did for a while and they, not many came back, um, even when we disabled them. So it doesn't seem like it's, in our experience, it hasn't been something that has um, contributed. Uh, aside from during the emergency phase when we just really need to get people on there. So ideally for me, I know this is hoping for a lot, but ideally a student would have their phone so they can participate, blah, blah, blah. And then they would have some other thing like a small tablet, Chromebook, maybe a computer, so they can be doing the Burlington or the Canvas or the what have you. But I want them to be able to, to participate if, they, if all they have is a phone. So that means when I design Canvas, Courses, I need to make sure that there's not a whole bunch of extra stuff, um, all these kinds of things. I'm not a you know a UI guy, but I try to think about what it looks like to somebody else. Okay, <laughs> sorry, this is a this is a pet peeve. Um, when we're when we're sharing Google Docs, who doesn't, right? Uh, we're sharing Google Docs. If we do the the normal control plus plus control minus minus to make it bigger for Grandma then what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a much bigger ribbon and the text doesn't change size. It's just a pet peeve for me. I like to show people, I like them to feel like they're watching a movie, Like there's nothing, there's nothing there except the experience. So what I'll do is first I'll, I'll punch this up to about 150 or 200. This is for me too, right? I can't read those. I can't read words that small, even standing right here, it's pretty hard. So I uh, punch it up to about 150, 200, press F11, get rid of that stuff. That's it right there. So that's the other option for that. We're probably all familiar, or you can hit F11. They don't make it easy on these keyboards, not just this one, but lots of keyboards out there. Like, do oh, I press F11? There's always some other activation key, right? You have to get first. It'll be different on every one. So, yeah, it's a process. Okay, 2021. I don't want to go back to work. Um, <laughs> 
Where'd she go? Funny baby. Where'd she go? All right. <laughs> My wife liked this one. It's cute. Um, in 2021, we had partial return to in person. Um, and I'm going to talk about the agencies where I was working at the time. Uh, I don't know what happened with everybody, um, but we did a lot of we do we do entrance surveys and exit surveys like you all do. Um, we get a lot of quantitative and qualitative data from people. How many do this? How many like this? How many don't? Um, at our agency, we started doing uh, CASAS test administration in person again. It was it was the practical thing to do, and um, vaccine was widely available. People were taking it. Our distance learning program continued to the delight of some and the chagrin of <laughs> others. Not everybody, not everybody likes it, but that's what this whole presentation is about. One size fits some. Um, you remember that the, we heard about the, the great resignation around 2021? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's supported by, by data, but um, we all know that everybody has a friend who says, I'm not going back, I'm not going back. That was me. I went back, but that was my that was my memory of working in in industry and then working in uh, a cube a cube farm in education. Didn't want to do that again, uh, but you know across agencies and institution types, there's there's broad broad variation. I'll tell you about four that I was working for at the time. Compare their different strategies. North Orange continuing. It's a it's a fairly large program in um, Anaheim, and I teach there um, online every day. Uh, their program is fully 50% distance learning, and it's not because the administration decided they wanted it that way. It's what the students continue to ask for. That's just this campus. It's not everywhere. Um, we still, as I mentioned before, we all do CASAS online for all of those online courses. Co-op assessments are all done online. Um, it's really, really streamlined. The co-op process is really, really streamlined there. Um, it's it's Microsoft Forms. Yeah, I don't, I'm not a fan, but as soon as they complete those, it goes right to their data people. I don't have to print anything out. I don't have to waste any paper. It's just done. It's amazing. Uh, of course, all instructions online and all homework is on the LMS. And um, aside from Burlington English, I've been really good at talking people into getting Burlington for my students. So only, only my class at the whole community college has Burlington English. So aside from Burlington English, um, we use absolutely nothing that costs any money. So I've switched to completely OER text for this class and all of my classes. As I mentioned before, the data bear out and the students strongly prefer online learning. Um, over here at UC Davis back in, I'm talking about 2021 now, all of our um, overseas programs still remain 100% online. Um, but when uh, American students did foreign foreign language uh, placements, they were all online. They still are. Um, it's kind of a self assessment now. Um, students in per whether in person or at a distance, all of their midterms or finals, all the big stuff, it's all on the LMS. So we really left forward there. And I think that you know, I actually <laughs> want I want to thank that penguin in the back, not for most of what they did, but because we got this, we got this leap forward that we weren't prepared to do before that, before we were forced to do it, we weren't ready to do it. I would still be driving, you know, 17 hours a week to, to go to work. And so would a lot of people. Um, UC Davis in the next year, it should be 2022, I can't see what it says. Yeah. Okay, so these days, we're down to about 10% distance learning. We kind of relegate it to um, when someone is violently ill, right? that kind of thing. The students are extremely flexible now in learning modality. They can't, they're coming to us from high schools where they may have done two years online already. So they're totally primed for this. They don't think it's weird. They don't think it's not a class, right? You tell them, oh, we have to uh, be online. I did this yesterday. Sorry, folks, you have to be online. I'm going to be in San Diego. Okay, what time? Right? That's the question. That's the whole question. So it's become quite normalized. Um, and we're still doing foreign language proficiency placement exams online and everything on LMSs. Um, and this is true both at the main campus and at the, um, the Center for Professional Education where I teach international students. <clears throat> okay, what about Folsom Cordova? This is the school that I am here representing today. In 2021, um, it went from about 50% to about 25% distance learning. 
um, students indicated very rigid preferences in terms of their modality. I want all online or I want all in person. And um, at this at this time, instructors of online courses were teaching from offsite, gradually started coming back to the campus. 100% uh, of cost is testing being done in person. Um, as far as the online courses go, everything has been done all on the uh, LMS for a couple of years and um, assessments and all those kinds of things. Um, even in face-to-face -face classes, um, by this point, it about, yeah, well, we'll come to that. Okay, 2022, about 25%. Okay, Sac State, uh, I teach French here. Um, these days, when I started teaching there in 2022, it's 25% distance learning, that's on a regular schedule, but anytime we need to do distance learning, we do that as well. Uh, the students are very, very flexible, as I was describing a moment ago. Um, people who are teaching online courses are teaching from on-site and off-site and in a hybrid manner. So the way our hybrid courses are set up there, it's just a uh, computer on a podium with a camera facing the instructor and a camera facing the audience. It's pretty cool, but it's no owl, right? So it works, but it's not, um, it's not ideal. Uh, all of course, all course weekend assessments on the LMS are done um, uh, are done on the LMS, and we've done a lot of work on Canvas this year, which I'll come to. Okay, 2022, you guys know what happened. We continue to return to in person, but not 100 percent. Distance learning is normalized at all levels, kindergarten to grad school. Um, agencies and instructors figured out they need to be very agile. Uh, we might have to. Come into distance learning if there's a natural disaster. Right? You guys know we had some very bad flooding in Northern California recently. So, and what about the next pandemic? Right, I hear that. I hear that from people sometimes. Um, or the next disaster, whatever happens. Right, there are going to be cases where you're not going to want to be driving for safety concerns. Um, okay, so <laughs> CASA's test administration in purpose in person continues apace. Uh, and our distance learning can, uh, program is continuing at, um, at Folsom Cordova. We have begun adding hybrid courses. That's just a beta test that we're doing this year. Next year, we want to add high flex courses. Okay, I'd like to talk about our paraeducator training program. This is one of our uh, biggest CTE IET programs. Um, before before the virus, um, it was taught in person. Uh, it was three or four times a week. Um, the enrollment numbers were not astounding. And um, everything was done on sort of static PowerPoints with a math mathematics focus. So probably just like your districts, uh, we have a district level uh, proficiency test that people need to pass mm -hmm. before they can be you know, brought on as a, as a parent here. It's never the math that people have problems with. It's always the English. So in our uh, in our district. So being a language teacher, I rewrote this program um, and turned it into a uh, heavily English focused program with mathematics included. Um, back then, the supplemental stuff was just all flat PDFs, just really scans of like mimeographs or something really not easy on the eye. Uh, and we had eight graduates per semester, which would render about four paras for our uh, district at a time. 2020, boom, they asked me to take over the course. So I put it all online. Um, in 2020, our enrollment numbers doubled and then the next year tripled. And now they've stayed, they've stayed steady since then. Um, we do everything dynamically on our LMS, of course. Um, it's a language arts focus with math. I use OER text for math. I'll tell you exactly which one later on. Um, all of the supplemental stuff is dynamic. Everything in there, they interact with. So there's no, well, teacher, how can I study my math? Oh, I don't know, go look at this piece of paper, right? None of that. Uh, now we have, we graduate about 25 per semester, which gives us about half that many paraeducators. Not everyone goes on to be a paraeducator in our district, uh, but they, they usually do so somewhere. I also added a lot of asynchronous content. Can't see my my gorgeous YouTube face. Okay. <laughs> um, whoops. I'm doing that. Okay. 
at an asynchronous content. This is where I'm live streaming right now on my YouTube channel, uh, which has 56 subscribers. So subscribe if you would. Um, the, the training program is delivered 100% synchronously, but what if you're sick? What if you have to take your kid to blah, blah, blah? Right? All these kinds of things. I want that to be available for folks. Um, and they tell me that they really appreciate it. I thought that um, I'm always really self-conscious about, about lectures. You can see this one is 45 minutes long. And I think to myself, nobody wants to watch that. But that's not what they tell me. <laughs> yeah, this is the this is the face that I imagine, <laughs> right? When I post these things, I think, oh, it's just me talking. But consistently, these are the qualitative data we get. Good, good stuff. Okay, more about the PTP. Um, from 2021 on, we started growing the course. It went from being a course to being a program. We have two courses now. Uh, you need to take both courses in order to graduate. It's 100% online, 100% synchronous. And I expanded the curriculum with OERs. So we started putting more um, human development uh, content into the curriculum. Uh, the idea being that if our, if our students graduate and become paraeducators, and then take six units of human development, then they have the right, as you guys probably know, they have the right to become preschool teachers. So I wanted to really prime them for that. If they didn't have any background in a uh, cloud, what? Okay, cloud going by. If they didn't have any background in it to begin with, then it's a good way to prime them. We also want to bring community college courses onto our campus starting next year. Hope that's what's going to happen, and the students do as well. Um, Right, added elementary elementary algebra. I'll show you exactly which books those are. We brought on Keely. Keely is a professor of human development at Folsom Lake College. So she was a, a real win, a real win for us. Um, and if the, the plan that I described is carried out next year, she'll be the instructor for those courses. We added the um, IET VSL, VESL course. Um, ask me how to make lots of extra money for your district. <laughs> this is it, honestly, um, because teaching this course, we instruct the 70.2 co-op, which is uh, the instructional assistant, and doing that alongside the, the IET course renders a lot of good stuff on the back end. Uh, right, HEL Civics, we get tangible benefits, the students also get tangible benefits. Okay. Kept growing the program. Now it's, it's, I don't know, people keep telling me it's it's a big deal. I don't know if it is, but it continues. Um, now we are able to administer the ESSA compliant test at our office instead of having to send people to the district office. So that's been really helpful, I'm told by staff. Um, and for those who don't pass and haven't taken our course, they're allowed to take it until they pass. It's kind of like a driver's license though. You've got to wait two weeks before you can you can do it again. Um, but usually what we say is, why don't you, why don't you take the course? You come take the course, it's only like four and a half months long, and then take the test again. So that's an option as well for them. Okay, what did we learn? What have we learned to date? The first one is this barrier to education that we didn't know was there. It's kind of like proving a null. You don't know that something is not there in some cases. So. The form of physical location in space, this was a problem for a lot of people. We didn't know that until 2020. 95% of our participants um, are moms who only have free time between X and Y. That's where the course falls. So it's perfect for them. Uh, or they've been moms for a very long time and they're looking for a change, something else to do. So, um, and then there are cultural considerations too. I am a male instructor. Not everybody wants a male instructor. So moving it online um, really removed this barrier. And yeah, we couldn't be happier. Couldn't be happier. Um, I mentioned before, we do a lot of qualitative and quantitative analyses of what the students want, what they want from us. And overwhelmingly, they say, we want online. We've asked them pointedly again and again, would you like to come on one day a month, Friday afternoon for an hour, check in with us? Nope, we sure don't. We had one out of 25 last semester say that they did. And we would accommodate that person. She could come in, you know, and Keely would, would have a session with her, but not happening. Uh, yes, so 
remain firmly online. Okay, free stuff. Who doesn't like it? Free, free, free. So we removed even more barriers by adding these OER texts. I think sometimes people look at community college courses and they focus on the college part and they say, oh, that's going to be hard. It's going to cost money. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. This removes that fear because it's free and it's accessible. Right? It's, sign up. It takes five minutes to sign up. Um, on OER Commons, I found this great book called, imaginative, imaginatively called Human Development. It's put out by the uh, Portland State University Press. There's a link. Every single one of these pages here has tiny little tiny little URLs for everything that I that I talk about. So if you see the uh, presentation later on, you download it from somebody, you'll be able to click on all those things. Okay, at this point, all four of these institutions where I currently work have adopted OER texts. And I'll talk about each one. I've talked all about uh, NOCE uh, and Folsom Cordova. We'll actually come back to those in the next, in this slide, which I just touched. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, at UC Davis, I stopped using any kind of uh, four pay curriculum like uh, Azar, Azar, as I say. Um, or anything else like that. Um, and at Sacramento State, we have decided to stop asking the students to buy $300 textbooks. Who would have thought, you know? So we really like VHL. It's kind of the, the foreign languages equivalent of, uh, of Burlington English. It's, it's very nice. It makes things easy for teachers. It does not make things easy for students, right? So for, for folks who might be uh, struggling just to you know, pay for gas to get to class that day, you know, we don't want to do that. Also, we want people to enroll for our majors. So, free. Okay. Um, this is something I really want to evangelize for. Um, this, this series of ESL books, you know, when you go into OER Commons, nothing has a uh, fancy, splashy, you know, front page. They're always just black and white, um, as opposed to the stuff you pay for, right? But image, li image licensing is expensive. Um, anyways, Rebecca Alheider, she's a professor at Reedley College. I always, I always talk to somebody who knows her. Uh, I've spoken to her before too. She's great. Um, anyway, she's written all of these different ESL books, and there's a great crossover between OER Commons and Canvas Commons because she has taken like four of her books and put them online in in full form. So everything from the books um, has been, you know, translated to uh, dynamic exercises in Canvas. So whenever I get a new student in beginning ESL, intermediate ESL, advanced ESL, I say, guys, here's the whole book. The first, the first module in the class is textbook, one word, right? Textbook. You can download the book, it's big, or you can just look at all these modules because literally it's exactly the same thing. And sometimes they look and say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah it is. And sometimes they do and they don't tell me, and I don't know, but um, not a lot of downloads. So, Thank you, teacher Rebecca. And I always acknowledge her every, every time I'm teaching with her stuff. I say, well, teacher Rebecca says, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, what else? <clears throat> A little Latin lesson today, buyer beware. Um, students succeeded, succeed when we hold an in-person uh, an in-person orientation. I'm talking about paraeducator training program, but we want to do this for more of our, more of our offerings. This is something we didn't do for the first four semesters that I taught the class. And then Keely showed up and it was kind of her idea. She said, why don't we do this? And you know what, we did it. So we had the folks come in uh, before the class ever started. We showed them how to get on Zoom. We showed them how to get on Canvas. We showed them how to do this and do that. And you know what? I didn't spend a week with tech trouble the first week of class. So I had no I personally had no desire to do any in-person training, um, but we did it. And we'll do it again because it was such it was it was such a come up. It was really nice. One size fits some, right? So I was a little rigid in my thinking. I thought I don't I don't want to do that on campus. You know, lots of folks are not vaccinated, but um, turns out masks masks prevent COVID. So I put one of those on. Okay, let's talk about our DLAC project. We're really excited about it. Um, you guys know that uh, Hyflex is kind of new in adult education. At Folsom Cordova, it's entirely new. We don't have any towels yet. We do have uh, three of these polycom cameras, which are cool, but they take 
unidirectional pictures. So if I were to set one up up here, it would get all of you folks, it would get the top of my head, right? It would follow me around like the owl does, but it's not quite, it's not quite the same experience. Or if I put it in the back of the room, it would be equally as effective, but it's myopic. So um, currently, we're doing some sort of alpha and beta testing um, in terms of the, the hybrid courses. It is bolt on right now, it's not built in. It's something that is probably perceived by people as being um, extra or you know, not endemic to instruction, but I could be projecting on that one. I haven't done the qualitative research to find out. Anyways, our proposal is to implement high flex learning modalities in uh, ABE, ASC, ESL and at our Math Success Academy. We've got teachers identified for all of these. They're really, really good folks. Every time I go into their classrooms, it's just, wow, you are great. So those are the ones that we want doing this kind of thing, you know, in my, in my view. Okay, there's me teaching the unvaccinated with um, the Polycom camera, That's, which is over here. Cindy took this photo, thanks Cindy. And, um, just beta testing it just to see how people enjoyed it. And you know what? It's amazing. These guys are from an earlier class. They came to my earlier class and came to this class because that's, it's extra learning. It's extra free stuff. Why wouldn't I want to do that? I don't have anything else to do today, right? So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And um, it's been working well, but since I'm, you know, certain things are just, they're the domain of unions. I can't, Map things on walls. I can't paint my classroom, right? I can't do stuff like that. So I can't take the polyton and mount it back here if I want to. Or I can't put it on top of the, the whiteboard if I want to. I want to, but I'm not going to do that because it's not <laughs> it's not germane. Our new modality will be high flex. We assume that 100% online and 100% offline um, are also one size fits some approaches, um, that they don't cover everyone. Some students can't do either and some want to do both. So this might, may not be a revelation to you all, but to me, it sort of was. Oh, hey, there's a middle ground. There's a middle ground there. Um, and maybe there are many middle grounds, in fact. Here's our timeline. Next year, 2023, 2024 school year, our process is, is, is this. Um, we have complete, uh, completed our DLAG project proposal. That's why I'm here today. Um, uh, our principal has just finished the grant application. I think it's Measure H grant. I think it's what it was. That's done. We're waiting to hear back from that. Um, and part of that grant is, of course, the the owls. But right now, uh, we're carrying out the the Polycom camera beta testing. I should mention that we have those cameras in two other classrooms, and the teachers are are trying them out as well. Uh, in, in March, we always do a needs assessment. So that'll happen as, as it does usually. Uh, it's coming up and I, I personally need to get on that actually. Um, pending the grant approval, we want to implement the usage of the OWLs in the first weeks of the next year. And then I'm going to have to do a lot of teacher training. <laughs> August is going to be busy, you guys. Um, I'm taking July off, so don't call me Netta. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah. And doesn't do it when I want it to. Okay. I did something wrong. There we go. Okay. So thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Um, that was <laughs> essentially everything in a nutshell. We hope to see you in Fremont next year and present on what we, what we found in the first semester. Um, for further language teaching adventures, please come find me on YouTube at Language teacher in 3266. They gave me that. I couldn't do anything about it. Uh, and also, you can check me out on Academia um, and hire me to do something. I could, uh, yeah, I could create classes for your, for your, for your district, whoever you might be. Also, OTAN. And I have my email address here, <laughs> but you can find that easily enough. Hey, there he is. Okay. Please contact me at jjones at fcusd.org. I've been Avi. Thank you very much.